Hello, Keith Kaiser here again. We're doing another study in God's Holy Word, and we're doing studies in the book of Acts. Acts 28 is where we are today. We're beginning a new chapter, Acts 28, verse 1. You may have been getting seasick over the last several lessons because we were on that voyage with Paul, which culminated in a tremendous tempest, and yet, though tempest tossed, as it were, Paul and his fellows were delivered by God's providential mercy. They all arrived safely to land. And so now, welcome to Malta. I hope you brought your passport to be stamped. Acts 28 verse 1 is where we are. Let's read in the word of God. Now when they had escaped, they then found out that the island was called Malta. And the natives showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. Now being a frequent traveler myself, I'm always grateful when one encounters unexpected kindness from the locals. You know, you can kind of, having had some bad experiences over the years in certain places, you land in a foreign city, you find all the restaurants are closed around you, or you can't find adequate provisions, or maybe even finding a decent bed to sleep in is a challenge. And uh, what a frustrating thing that can be. So you can kind of get jaded as a repeat traveler. You can sort of assume with some measure of cynicism, well, people aren't really going to be nice to me. Strangers aren't inclined to show kindness. And yet, uh, when you encounter unexpected kindness, it's truly something that buoys the spirit. It, it encourages one, and it's cause for giving thanks to God. Because again, we talked about providence the last time, God working through natural circumstances to bring about his ends. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Excuse me, still working through a little cold that's hanging on. But Acts 28 is going to show us another instance of God's providence, that they don't end up on a deserted island where they all starve to death. They end up on an inhabited island, and the local natives turn out not to be cannibals or headhunters or some kind of uh, vicious group of barbarians that want to tear them limb from limb. Rather, they're people that take pity on them, that show them hospitality, which was tremendously important in the ancient world and remains so in this world. Christians are exhorted repeatedly in the New Testament to show hospitality, a love of strangers, as one of the New Testament Greek words uh, approximates to, you know, that we are willing to take care of those who don't have enough, who are traveling through, who are strangers, refugees perhaps, uh, somebody in circumstances where they need a meal or need help in getting a place to stay. Christians are to be alert to those opportunities. And especially, of course, Galatians 6 would remind us to the household of faith. So to our fellow believers, uh, we want to be very solicitous and caring for their needs. Uh, what a wonderful privilege it is to open one's home to traveling believers. I grew up in a home where my parents were very exercised about the Bible's teaching in this, and they felt from the Lord having a home, they should use it for the glory of God. And early in my life, it was a smaller home. Later, as I got into my teen years, they had a large home. And either way, whether they had large homes or small homes, they frequently had people in for meals. Uh, very often, they were Christians from the local church or sometimes missionaries that were traveling through or visiting preachers. And, and so I grew up in a home where I saw firsthand the joys of showing hospitality and getting to know others around the table and in the living room and seeing people in more personal situations. And uh, thankfully, my wife, Naomi, grew up in the same kind of home where they were always having uh, people in and very often uh, college students and folks like that coming down to their home and sometimes even unbelievers. So when we got married, we made it a priority to use our home, even though at first we had a very small home and now our home is a bit bigger and we're able to do more with it. Uh, but we've tried to make it something where we show hospitality. And I can't tell you what a blessing that was for Naomi and me growing up, how much we learned from others, <coughs> how we got to love and appreciate our fellow saints, how we got to care for unbelievers even that had needs, and uh, how we're trying to convey that now to our children. And we're seeing them 
enter into that a bit and having the joy of, in some cases, giving up their room to make room for others to come and stay or at least having people in. And uh, we travel a lot for the work of the Lord, but when we're home, we try to have people in. And so uh, very often in a week, uh, the kids are saying to us, well, who are we having over this week? You know, who's coming over? So it becomes a natural sort of thing. And I want to stress, I've been on both sides of it. I've been the one showing hospitality. More frequently, I've been the one receiving hospitality. And I can just say that it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be a meal according to a certain standard. You don't have to break the bank in showing hospitality. You don't have to be Julia Child or Bobby Flay or uh, Guy Fieri even in uh, making something spectacular. Just the ordinary stuff you eat. I mean, the Lord told his followers, eat what is set before you and ask no question. You know, the epistles say, eat what is set before you and ask no question for conscience sake in 1 Corinthians. But the Lord told the disciples when they went out two by two, enter into a house and eat what is set before you. So, you know, we're not there to be Zagat rating or AAA rating people where we give a certain rating on the food we're getting or the bed we sleep in, or what we're treated as. We should be thankful for food, for clothes, for a roof over our heads, and we judge hospitality by those simple standards. Now, (coughs) excuse me, I can also say, being the frequent recipient over the years of the hospitality of the people of God, I have extremely few bad experiences. That Mostly, I've found uh, fellow Christians to be very warm and welcoming, and to just give us more than we deserve and to treat us way beyond really what we have coming to us. So in that, we've seen the gracious providence of God. Uh, Have we had a few bad experiences? Yeah, a few, but very, 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 very few. So few, in fact, I can't even call any to mind, being quite honest with you. I mean, I tend to not dwell on those things. I commit it to the Lord and say, well, it's a shame that that person maybe didn't really want to have us over or it's a shame this didn't go well or it's a shame uh, the discussion in the home wasn't so good for various reasons. I mean, there can be many reasons why you have a bad experience. But don't dwell on the bad experience. Move on to the good experience. And if you're the one showing the hospitality, say to yourself, now how can I show the love of Christ to this brother or sister? You know, it doesn't have to be fancy but it ought to be genuine. It ought to be because Christ has loved us and given us what we have as stewards. It may be ever so little. I've stayed in developing world places where the believers treat us so well with the very little they have. And by our standards, you know, we know it's very little. It's not comfortable. It's not always fun. But the love comes through, and that's what matters. And so I'd go and stay in those places anytime with a brother or sister in Christ, and I'd give glory to God and thanks to him for the experience. Because it's not at the end of the day, uh, like going to the Hampton Inn, that you're judging the bed and judging the, the hotel meal or whatever. It's about fellowship. It's about spending time with members of our spiritual family, fellow Christians, getting to know each other, encouraging one another, building one another up in the faith, talking about the Lord together. That's a beautiful thing to do. Now, getting back to Malta, they received this providential mercy of God that they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling. So it was cold, we read here. (coughs) Now, this is a, a part of the story, excuse me, that one of my children in particular loves because she's very fond of reptiles. And Paul picks up a bundle of sticks to throw on the fire. And out comes a viper and attaches to his hand. Now that is something that makes my skin crawl. I uh, really don't want to think too much about snakes. I have had a lifelong fear of them uh, due to an unfortunate incident when I was five years old at a certain serpentarium in Miami. But anyway, that's another sermon, as they say. Suffice it to say, this deadly viper affixes itself to Paul's hand. And for anybody else, that would probably equate to certain death. But we read here in verse 3, when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat 
and fastened on his hand. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow to live. So they're looking at providence. They're looking at the circumstances around them. <clears throat> and they're also judging that there's spiritual forces at work here, that the gods, as they think, because they're pagan people, they're not believers, they're no doubt idolaters, they think, well, justice, you know, the Greek god of justice is one who has not suffered him to live. So he's obviously a murderer. This is what you call bad karma. You know, he's done something bad in his past, so it's coming back around on him. And yet it couldn't be farther from the truth. Not only is Paul not a murderer, he's not going to die. Rather than this viper fixing on him, meaning certain death, it's going to be a sign miracle to them that this is God at work. Now, they don't interpret it quite correctly. So this is the danger of looking at circumstances and trying to go simply on circumstances and judge what's happening, especially if you don't know the Lord, if you don't have the scriptures to tell you what's going on. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man's a murderer, who though he has escaped the sea, <coughs> excuse me, who though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow to live. But he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. However, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had looked for a long time and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. So they went from one extreme to the other. Oh, he's a bad man, and this is his bad deeds coming back on him. You know, the gods are getting him, as it were, for the bad life he's lived. And they now look at him and say, well, since nothing bad happened to him, obviously he's a god. Well, actually, neither. He's a son of God by grace. He's, through adoption, put into God's family as a son <clears throat> and he's going to bring them the wonderful good news. That island's going to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's not a god, but God is at work in him for sure. And that's why he's preserved. Now you remember at the end of the gospel of Mark, the Lord tells them some of the signs that would accompany them as they went out and spread the gospel in that first century. That first generation of missionaries went out and did sign miracles because the gospel was going forth into new places, a brand new thing, and God was authenticating it and showing that this was really him at work. And one of the things the Lord Jesus said in Mark 16 is that they would take up serpents and not be harmed by them. And here Paul didn't do this sacramentally. He didn't do it intentionally, taking up a snake, you know, saying, see, look how filled with the spirit I am because the snake bit me and I wasn't harmed. You know, this isn't justification for snake handling churches. I mean, that's a serious and grievous error that has literally killed people. It's a misinterpretation of God's word and a misappropriation of dispensational truth that this was for the early church as that church was being laid, the foundation was being laid as it were. But now that we have the scriptures, now that the work of God has moved on, <coughs> and God doesn't typically work in these sign miracles. Nothing precludes him from working providentially. He does that daily. And nothing precludes him even from working supernaturally, from doing something so far beyond our expectation according to natural things. But in any case, we see here in Acts 28 the fulfillment of what the Lord spoke about in Mark 16, that in the course of his mission for the Lord as a missionary, Paul was not going to be hurt by this deadly viper. I mean, what a, a terrible way to end the ministry here. Instead of getting to Rome like the Lord told him to, that this venomous beast, this viper, would kill him right there on the island. But instead of killing him, it becomes an indicator. This is not a bad man. This is not a criminal. This is not a murderer. This is someone who comes from God. And so they better pay attention to him. They better listen to him. Well, in whatever we face in our course of duty for the Lord, as we serve the Lord and walk with the Lord in this world, the Lord protects us until his time when he calls us home. 
and it may be he calls us home through physical death, or it may be he himself comes in the air and catches us up to be with him. Either way, the believer has tremendous security through the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening.